So let's take one other case, very different kind of um, change to ask what happens, like how, fl so basically bottom line of all of this is stuff doesn't move around that much. Like early brain damage to language regions, they can shift to the homologous regions in the right hemisphere. But all the other data that I know of suggests you can't just take anything and move it around a few centimeters over, um, if, at least if you have the damage in adulthood and maybe even if you have it pretty early. Okay. All right. So now we're going to say, okay, might this organization nonetheless be very different if you had very different experience? Okay. So let's take the case of congenital blindness. Okay. So how is the brain organized in congenital blindness? Well, let's take V1. Here's this big chunk of cortex back here, nice big chunk of cortex that in all of you guys does vision. What does it do in congenitally blind people? Does it just sit there? Do the cells die out? Do they just go dum dee dum dee dum and they don't do anything? A lot of cortex to waste on all of that. What well, turns out, astonishingly, that what visual cortex does in blind people is a whole bunch of other things, including, astonishingly, language. So you present a sentence to subjects through braille or auditorily to blind subjects in the scanner and you see activation of V1. Okay. Further, you might think, well, okay, whatever, you know, it just turns on, it doesn't, you know, it has nothing to do with anything. But TMS studies, V1 is right near, near the surface of the brain. You can zap that region and ask if you're disrupting function and you can interfere with language tasks by zapping V1 in congenitally blind people. So it's not just activated, it's doing causal work in blind people. This is like mind blowing. I mean, this is like a totally different patch of cortex. Okay. So yeah, it's hard to think of more different functions than low level vision and high level abstract language processing. Right. So that suggests radical possible reorganization in this case with different experience. Okay. Um, Okay, what about those regions on the bottom surface of the brain, the face, place, uh, word, and body regions that we've been talking about for so long? What do they do in blind people? Somebody already asked me before, maybe Shokova, somebody over there, it's my spatial code. <laughs> um, and, um, and there's a lot of claims that they have similar selectivity, which I'm not totally sure of, but let me sh show you um, um, one piece of data. I promised you that there were going to be further contradictions in the whole saga of the role of experience and wiring up these regions. So here's one more contradictory piece of data. Okay, this is a paper that was published just a few months ago. And the title of the paper is that the development of visual category selectivity, that means face, place, body regions, all that stuff, in the ventral visual cortex does not require visual experience. Okay. What? 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 Um, okay, here's what they did. They scanned, it's a pretty crazy experiment. They scanned congenitally blind subjects while they heard sounds that were associated with faces, bodies, objects, and scenes. So for example, they might hear laughing, chewing, blowing a kiss, whistling sounds. Those are face-related sounds. Or they might hear scratching, hand clapping, finger snapping, barefoot steps, knuckle cracking. Those are body-related sounds, etc. So they're lying in the scanner hearing these sounds. Okay probably cracking up. Now the question is, do we see face, place, body, and object regions activated from sounds in congenitally blind people listening to those categories of sounds? And the crazy answer is kind of sort of a little bit. It's not super strong. The data are not, you know, mind blowing, but let me just show you what we have. Okay. This is the bottom of the brain, back of the brain, everybody oriented here. Okay occipital lobe. This is where all the good stuff is that we've been talking about. Okay. So this is now the sighted control subjects looking at visual stimuli. Okay. So this is a significance lap net map P levels. And so what you see is uh, face selectivity in red, object selectivity in green, uh, scene selectivity in um, blue, purple, whatever that is, blue. Okay. So that should look sort of familiar. Okay. Faces, lateral, scenes, medial. Okay, objects, mm, people debate about. I haven't talked about it much because anyway, faces and scenes, so stuff to pay attention to. Okay, um, and over here, is, this, this map is the same. It just says, never mind if that voxel reaches statistical significance. Just plot what category that voxel responds most to. Okay, so you just see a big swath. 
Okay. All right. Now, what do we see for sighted controls listening to the auditory stimuli? Not much reaches significance. Okay. If you drop the threshold way down and look at this, maybe a little bit. These are somewhat correlated, but it's lousy. Okay, so sighted subjects listening to those sounds, not much. What do you think happens with blind subjects listening to those sounds? Well, you get face selectivity here that's statistically significant. And if you drop the threshold and look at the overall map, you see a resemblance of this map to the sighted map the visual map in the sighted subjects, and this correlation is highly significant. So this is totally weird. It says, yes, there's a similar spatial layout on the brain of these same selectivities in congenitally blind subjects who never saw those stimuli. Okay? And that's the basis of their argument that the development of visually category selective uh, selectivity doesn't require experience. But now you may be thinking, what about that paper on face-deprived monkeys? The title of which is, Seeing Faces is Necessary for Face Domain Formation, namely for face patches. So these two findings, these two claims in the titles are completely um, contradictory. So we're out of time. Nobody knows the answer to this. It's an ongoing puzzle. There are all kinds of possibilities. There are different species. There are different kinds of tests. There are many kinds of things you could say, but we're really right on the horn of a, of a big conundrum in the field. And uh, all I have to say is welcome to the cutting edge. It's a mess there. Okay, thank you.